Now I'm heading up to the bulk. Uh, the first solar farm started going in around 2009, so. My, my presentation touches a little bit on not like on this ordinance, but like our solar ordinance guide we used to reference like setbacks. But I think it's got screening and decommissioning. Yeah. Is that I, okay? Yeah, what I just said is uh, tonight's workshops are amazing. Yeah. Everybody, you know, taken. Also, not able to answer specific questions about the solar farm project in Ray County. Okay. Yeah, because I just we we already have a solar ordinance guidebook, so I just have a chart. It's like. Penn County is an under grant. Yeah. Sure. But setbacks, it's grand. Yeah. Stuff for the extension is working on right? Yeah, yeah. We, we kind of just made our own solar on this guy. Yeah. I've been going around the state and all the counties making it. And stuff. Yeah. Like, become a solar expert. Yeah, because so, we, we met with like the Cass County commissioners in June. So I made this like for okay. that meeting. And okay. we've just been using it ever since. Um, that, that's when we did a little bit of that. So are you? I'm not sure. I, I think it's just like the meeting or anything. I don't think it's recording yet. Where's Nicole? Are you, oh, are you recording right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Or just going to we'll check it out yet. Okay. How are you? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on there, then I just went in my system references. I think it should be. And you're going to come up here? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, whatever works best. We can get up here. <laughs> Okay. 
They don't expect me to hop up on that stage, do they? Yeah. 
time. Got one AC bump in for air. Spread out and that's probably really not going there. Shit. Yeah. Story there. Yeah. All right, we'll get started here in the next couple minutes. If there's any other uh, people uh, 
Someone in another park is on. So we're going to start one or two minutes and get started. All right, good evening and welcome to Marion High School. Uh, today we're doing a book workshop uh, along by uh, Center for Center for Energy and Education. Catherine, Catherine will be uh, hosting this for us. Uh, we're basically here to find out and what could benefit to a community. Really not here to discuss anything as far as the, the county ordinance that's being developed. That is a different meeting. So I think capital plays we're going to go through here as far as today and this moment. Uh, there are restrooms in the back at the lobby, men's is off to this side. Maybe it's off that side. So we will just get started here. Introduction and thank you all for being here, both in person and online. Um, hopefully, everybody in here okay. All right, my name is Kathleen Stanley. I'm the outreach director for the Center for Energy Education in Indiana. And across the Midwest, there is a renewable energy change place. And for some, this transition needs are unexpected. And as the people have questions. Questions are welcome because our mission at the Center for Energy Education is to educate communities about renewable energy so they can make informed decisions that benefit their local communities. North Carolina, where our headquarters and main learning center are located, has experienced strong and steady growth in renewable energy development over the past decade. To give some context, last year North Carolina ranked fourth in solar energy development and Indiana ranked 18th. There are also a number of counties in Indiana that have first-hand experience with renewable energy development via wind energy. The goal of this evening's workshop is to share knowledge, data, and resources collected from those who have experienced renewable development. Tonight, we have presenters from both Indiana and North Carolina here to share their experiences and their expertise in renewable development, as well as the impact that development has had on their local communities in various ways. I want to be clear and reiterate tonight's workshop is not a meeting of any public body or will any official action be taken. So now, we are also not able to answer specific questions about projects um, being proposed in Brandon County or in the surrounding area. At the end of all the presentations, there will be time for questions, and I'll explain that process when we get to that point. If you uh, registered or signed in, we'll send a follow up email with additional information and resources. I'd like to begin tonight's presentation by sharing with you a little bit more about the Center for Energy Education and then take you on a virtual tour of a solar farm in North Carolina. Our 
our renewable energy learning center, a mixture of classroom facilities, educational displays, demonstration site, research facility, and training grounds for renewable energy construction and maintenance. Visitors from the local community, the state, and across the country travel to our center to experience renewable energy education. Our learning center is part of a 225-acre, 20 megawatts woodland. This farm has the capacity to hold over 100,000 animals and powers 3,400 homes. So the center not only to be educated about renewable energy, we're going to live next to it every day. As renewable energy development has expanded, so has our organization. And we now have offices and educational programs in Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana. The Center for Energy Education is a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to raise awareness about renewable energy and its importance locally, regionally, and globally. As a nonprofit, we work with a variety of partners in education, business, and philanthropy to support our educational mission. There are several ways in which we work to meet our mission. They include K-12 educational programming, teacher training, workforce development, community engagement, and industry research and training. I'll explain each of these a little bit more. The Center works with schools to provide supplemental educational programming and renewable energy education resources. Our educational programming aims to support learning in STEM disciplines through the framework of renewable energy. Our signature program is a Renewable Energy Summer Camp, which is a four-day hands-on learning experience for middle school students that we provide at low to no cost. Teacher trainings are held separately or in conjunction with summer camp. These trainings aim to support teachers with resources and ideas for bringing renewable energy education into the classroom. With the renewable energy transition comes significant opportunities for workforce development. Center for Energy Education supports workforce development by providing entry level utility scale solar construction, operation, and management. This training supports workers in accessing local renewable energy jobs. These jobs can then serve as an entry point into long term employment. Center facilitates additional solar research and training programs on site at our solar farm and out in the classroom. Finally, the Center for Energy Education connects with and educates communities about renewable energy and engagement programs such as science workshops. The Center works hard to provide reliable and up to date information, resources, and access to experts in renewable energy to communities that may be experiencing development in their area. Since 2017, the Center is connected with local communities across five different states. As part of our programs, we have over, we've had over 1,400 students experience our renewable energy summer camps, trained over 240 teachers, and over 260 successful graduates from our solar construction and safety courses, over 600 public officials, and had more than 1,300 visitors to our learning center. If you'd like more information about the Center for Energy Education, you can connect with us across social media. Or visit our website for more information and resources. I'd now like to take you on a tour of the virtual tour of Solar Farm in North Carolina. Uh, the first solar farm started going in around 2009, so um, there's not a lot of uh, trained help out there. And that's one of the things we do at the Center for Energy Education is I teach a lot of classes for construction. So they'll bring in people with no training. We'll give them some of the skills they need to get on a site to be able to do an installation. Welcome to the Center for Energy Education virtual solar farm tour. My name is Jason Bone, Department Head for Halifax Community College's Industrial Systems Technology Program. I also do solar training for the Center for Energy Education through courses such as construction and operations and maintenance. Here we are in North Carolina on a five megawatt solar farm. It sits on 55 acres of land and was commissioned in 2016. You may be wondering what makes a location optimal for a solar farm basically the same thing that makes a piece of land optimal for farming. In fact, that's 
what is usually used is farmland in some states. But they want a large plot of land that gets sun, that's, you know, solar. On top of the desired piece of land, shade free, they also have to be close to a substation where they can tie into the distribution line, which are going to be phase power, unlike single phase, which is what we have in our homes. So if you see a solar farm, as you can see in some of your video today, you'll notice that there is fencing with barbed wire along the top. It has several purposes. One is to keep wildlife out. The other is to keep people out. Uh, part of the National Electric Code says anything over 30 volts have to be uh, non-accessible to humans. And these uh, systems are typically at 1,000 volts DC. So it's, it's for safety. So here we see a PV module. This is one of the most common type of PV modules you're going to find out there on a rooftop or on a utility scale system like we have here. This is a polycrystalline module. Uh, another popular type is called a monocrystalline. Those are the two modules that dominate the industry. And what they're made out of is silicon. Silicon is the second most abundant element on Earth other than oxygen. 25% of the Earth's crust is, is silicon. Uh, so it's not a, shouldn't be a concern you know, we shouldn't be afraid of silicon. This would not work if it wasn't for silicon. These phones are full of it. That's how it makes all the chips inside of them work. That's what they're made out of. In fact, this is very much made exactly like those chips are made. It's what we call a PN junction. And that's exactly what the chips in your phone, in your computer, if you use transistors for stereos, all of these things. Uh, any device in your home that you plug into the wall, for the most part, takes the AC from the grid, turns it into DC through a PN junk. Um, so silicon, all of our electronics are, are full of silicon. To see the entire system, everything that is in, required to generate this electricity on the solar farm, what we have to have are our PV modules. A lot of folks call them solar panels, that's fine. We need these modules. They harvest the sun, generate DC voltage, DC current. We send that to a combiner box to combine all these rows of modules together. Then that DC current is then sent to this inverter, which is right here behind us. This inverter turns that DC into AC electricity, sends it to a transformer, and it's pumped up onto the grid. Each string, as we saw earlier, was putting out roughly thousand volts at roughly 8.6 each one of these red conductors you see coming in is one string each one of them is roughly a thousand volts and it's going to depend on the time of the day really but um and at max current it would be 8.6 free amps coming in on each of those red conductors then those are all connected in parallel voltage stays the same in parallel at that point the current becomes additive the arrays on a solar farm are typically going to be oriented in two directions. For a fixed array, they're going to be facing due south to maximize their solar potential. And on a tracking system, the modules will be sitting east to west, and they will track the sun as it rises in the east in the morning and track it throughout the day as it sets in the west. One of the big concerns with solar farm design is inner row spacing. One of the concerns is we don't want the shade on the row to be cast on the row behind it, as this could, would be detrimental to power production. As far as a fixed array system, there are no trackers, so there are no motors running. Uh, the systems are pretty much dead quiet. On a tracking system like we're on today, the motors, th th these modules are moving maybe two degrees every two or three minutes. The motors will cut on for 15 seconds and then they're off. From where we're standing, and you can, maybe you can see some of the tracking equipment behind us, uh, it's virtually no sound at all. One of the big concerns that we have here, being asked all the time from local people in the community, is will anything go up under these modules? They have this idea that once these modules are put in place, nothing will grow under them, and once it's all removed in 20 to 30 years, the land is going to be of no use. But if you can look back behind me, you can see there's grass growing underneath these arrays. There's grass growing down all the rows. There's zero concern as far as uh, the environmental concern of vegetative growth. 
you know, they have to come out here and cut this grass because of that. Is glare a concern? That's another big question we get asked. Well, if you think about the job of the PV module, the solar module, its job is not to reflect the sunlight, but to harvest the sunlight. So the reflectivity of the PV modules is just a little bit higher than the reflectivity of the asphalt that's making up our roads. There are many job opportunities working in renewable field uh, or in solar in general. Um, you could possibly go to your local community college and take courses in installation, system design. Those are the type of courses that I teach. Through the Center for Energy Education, I also teach courses in construction for the crews coming in to put these large scale systems in. Uh, I've also done some training for the operation and maintenance for the personnel who come out and maintain these systems. They address any downtime. There are many other job opportunities in the solar industry. They need accountants with special skills. They need lawyers with special skills to create these deals. They need IT personnel. All this equipment is networked and all the data, how much power is being produced. How bright is the sun today? What is the temperature of these modules? What is the wind speed and what is the local ambient temperature? All this data is being sent to a data center where analysts are now analyzing this data, determining how much power should be being produced, and then that can be checked against how much data actually is being produced. And from that, they can determine whether or not there is a concern. The lifespan of a solar farm is typically 20 to 30 years. That's the modules all have a 20 year warranty on them. Most of the inverters have a 15 to 20 year warranty on them. Most of the deals are made for 20 to 30 years. Another big question is what happens when it's all done? 25 years later, the lease is up on this piece of land. Are they just gonna drive away and leave all this here? No, there is huge scrap value in this. This solar farm is 90% recyclable. Typically, at the very beginning, at the very first deal, money, uh, that's part of the actual plan, money is put into escrow to have this system removed upon decommissioning. The hopes are at the end of that 25-year lease is that you're going to re-up the lease and they can you know, keep on generating free power from the sun. So why should we buy into solar? You know, one option is to continue burning coal, burning natural gas, but the reality is, maybe not in our lifetime, but in our children's lifetime, that's going to go away. You know, what kind of security are we leaving them? One thing we do know is that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, and for no fuel charge whatsoever, the sun is going to hit these modules and start generating free electricity. If we're using wind turbines, the same thing is going to happen. The wind is going to blow, no charge for fuel. We're getting free electricity. If we're using hydro, once again, it's going to continue to rain. The water cycle is going to continue. The rivers are going to continue to flow. We're going to continue to have clean electricity. No fuel charges whatsoever. That's the best reason I can think of to buy into solar. We don't have a fuel charge. We can build a coal plant. We can build a solar farm. Once the coal plant is built, every day we have to have a train using diesel fuel deliver coal so the coal can be burnt, emitting CO2 into the atmosphere so that we can make electricity. Or we can build a solar farm. Once the solar farm is built, it just sits here. We don't have to use any trucks to deliver any fuel. Every single day, the sun's going to rise, the sun's going to shine on these modules, and free of charge, they're going to generate electricity clean energy, no emissions. At the Center for Energy Education, we've trained over 200 men and women for jobs in the solar industry, performing construction, building solar farms, much like you've seen today, and also performing operations and maintenance on these systems. Stay in touch with us at centerforee.org. I'm sorry if there was a bad echo for those of you who are online. Um, if you'd like to see that, you can also find that on our website and our YouTube page if you want to see that video again. Um,
Up next, we have our next presentation about protecting private property rights. We have Jonathan Cox, he's the Indiana Field Director for the Lincoln Coalition. Here, just give us a moment to uh, switch out. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Cobb, and I'm the Field Operations Director of the Indiana Land and Liberty Coalition. So, the Indiana Land and Liberty Coalition is a conservative grassroots organization that's focused on protecting private property rights, increasing economic development, and lowering local taxes through a multi level approach to energy. So, that means we support not only solar, but also every single energy source you can think of nuclear, hydroelectric, coal, gas, natural gas, anything that can help produce energy, power Indiana, and help local economies across the state. And in a state where only a few counties have coal, even fewer have natural gas reserves to tap, all 92 counties now have the opportunity to increase their tax base and generate low cost energy by cultivating the power of the sun. So this is our team um, behind in the picture on the left in our uh, Indiana Conservative Alliance for Energy, which we're a project of. Uh, the director is Casey Crane, uh, and Rick Davis is our field representative for uh, in the Indiana Land and Liberty Coalition. He, he would have been here today, would be on stage, but he's about to come home, so he's with his sister at the hospital. Uh, but uh, there's many reasons why we support development across the state of uh, various development. Uh, but uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I thought I missed the screen. Uh, so, technological advancement over the last decade is the real reason why solar development has um, springboarded across the state just in the last couple of years. Uh, so, I originally started the Land and Liberty Coalition three years ago, and three years ago, there were no solar plants in Indiana. We weren't even really working on any projects in the state here. Uh, but in the last decade, solar development costs have dropped over 90%, and the efficiency of the panel has uh, increased dramatically. So, originally, solar panels were stationary, they were just driven into the ground, they didn't track the sun, and uh, you had to face them to the west when the sun was rising. But now, these modern panels um, are bifacial, they track the sun, and they can collect all different types of rays. Uh, from the sun, even on cloudy days, whether that's reflecting off the clouds or reflecting off the ground for the double sided panel. Uh, and the big reason a lot of counties across the state are considering uh, solar development right now is they help circumvent the property tax caps uh, that are well, proposed that they're implemented at the state level in every single county in the state. So in Indiana, right now, the local property taxes are capped at 1% of residential property. 2% on farmland and 3% on all other property. So, of all crops being grown, you can only get 2% for the county coffers um, by through taxes. But with solar farms, uh, you can circumvent this in multiple different ways. Uh, so, solar farms are taxed as utilities, allowing the county to collect millions more in taxes from development rather than from the county residents, uh, which decreases the tax burden for everyone in the county. And probably Properly crafted economic development agreements can provide counties with billions of dollars on, on your marks uh, that can be used however the county sees fit. So, we've seen a few projects that have uh, gotten abatements with the economic development agreements. Um, and instead of just the county government giving money, people don't know where it's going, and it has to go into certain things, uh, usually they'll get money up front that the county and the council the commissioners can use however they see fit. Or, uh, the community development projects, whether that's community centers or anything the uh, local leaders you like to see fit. And then the third reason uh, we're seeing a lot of development right now is uh, this is an increasing and diversifying income streams for farmers and private landowners. So in, in the past uh, year or so, uh, crops were trading at their lowest level in decades. Now it's boosted it up a little bit. The farmers are still uh, dependent on the weather or droughts or whatever the crop production is for that year. So, leasing some of your land for solar farms allows farmers to get a stable drought resistant income that goes far above the rate of crop production, and it allows them to keep the land in the family name. I, I can get landowners where they're fifth generation farmers, their kids went off to college and they're about to retire. And they can either sell a family farm or they can lease land for the solar project and get more money than they ever could have imagined. So, 
these are some of the reasons why solar development has sprung up all over the state. And because of that, nearly half of all Indiana counties have now passed the solar ordinance. As of now, at least 45 counties have, uh, have they passed solar ordinances into law. And many counties, uh, including your own, uh, are developing solar ordinances right now. Uh, and as I mentioned before, a couple of years ago, there were no solar projects even approved in Indiana. Now there are many approved and one's even uh, officially completed. So in the past couple of months, Mammoth Solar, which is the largest uh, solar project in the country, Dunbridge One, which is in Jasper County, uh, Bellflower Solar, which is split between Henry Brush County, and Indiana Crossroads Solar, which is in White County, have all recently broken ground. Uh, in the past couple of months as well, Appleseed Solar in Cass County, Lost Street Solar in Alaska County, Mammoth Solar in Alaska County. It's split between two counties, and Dunn's Bridge and Jasper County have all recently been approved. And what, what's exciting is this can help generate a ton of tax revenue for counties that are in desperate need of it. In Jasper County, the Schaefer's Generation Station, the coal plant there, has been open for decades and decades. Uh, and it, the utility up there in Disco is shuttering it at the, the cost to bring in fuel uh, for the plant and uh, just the daily operation. But now they're able to build uh, what would be 700 megawatts of solar, replacing the tax base in the exact area where the coal plant was in the same township. So that community gets their tax base revenue. They don't have a 60% or so uh, decrease in the tax base, which would increase the taxes on everyone in the county. And uh, the farmers in the area are making more money than they ever would have living next to a coal plant. So Indiana right now has a corporate post solar on both the ISO grid and the PJM grid, uh, respectively, than any other state. So the ISO grid is sort of the Midwest, the mid-continental uh, operating system, and then the PJM, PGM stands for Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland. So it's sort of the East Coast power grid. So Indiana is situated right in the middle. So we're a uh, great area for development since we can uh, keep the power locally or send it anywhere in the country. Uh, so solar, by the um, we, we hear a lot about land use and uh, prime farmland and how it's best to utilize the, all the land in the county. So it does, it does sound a little intimidating with all the gigawatts of solar come in, but do not worry that that is, we're not going to have 40 gigawatts of solar come in for this county. So the Solar Energy Industry Association, they said, uh, less than one tenth of the proposed solar in Indiana will actually be constructed. So that 40 gigawatts will be more around 4.4 gigawatts. Currently, Indiana has over 15 million acres of farmland, uh, which produces mostly corn and soybean. Uh, and of those 15 million acres, 213,000 plus are currently in the Conservation Reserve Program, which is a government program where the government literally pays you to not use your land. So instead of land being taken out of production to generate energy, which is happening through ethanol and all types of biofuels and solar, they, the land is just not being utilized whatsoever. Uh, so breaking down sort of the top crop production in Indiana, 47% uh, of Indiana's corn already goes to energy production it with ethanol. And nationally, around 40% goes to ethanol, and nearly half of all corn goes to livestock. So in similar states like Iowa, 57 actually goes down from all 33 percent goes to uh, livestock feed. Then for soybeans, uh, 77 percent goes to livestock feed and around 4 percent goes to bio feed. And just over uh, uh, 20 percent is what you're actually consuming, whether that's tofu or uh, soybean oil for cooking or whatever else is made out of soy. But most soy is consumed in Asia, and in 2020, 55% of US ex exports and soybeans went to China, and China uses over one third of the world's supply of soybean. So, in conclusion, even if every single solar project built today, which won't happen, around one tenth of them will happen, uh, solar development would only utilize one to two percent of any of its total acreage. Uh, and the total acreage would be far less than what is already taken out of production here by the Conservation Reserve Program. And even the largest possible amount of solar built in Indiana would not affect our production whatsoever for what we're actually consuming. So, uh, a big reason the uh, 
The big reason the Land and Liberty Coalition exists is the protection of private property. And this is not a Green New Deal coming to town. This, despite some of our politicians' efforts, this, this will not be a government program this year to take land from unwilling participants and through ruling rural America. It's all private companies working with private landowners with leases where they keep their land and are able to use it however they see fit. So these solar projects are only voluntary participants and will never use an eminent domain. I would not be up here supporting these if they did use eminent domain. Uh, the solar projects, as I mentioned earlier, offer the farmers an opportunity to diversify their revenue with uh, drought resistant income and get more money than the market rate for crops. And we believe, as I mentioned earlier, that farmers and all landowners can like to use their land however they see fit, whether that's growing crops for food or energy production or generating energy via renewables and fossil fuels. So the key to developing and evolving solar ordinance that protects both project participants and non-participants alike is finding common ground where officials can presume, preserve landowners' rights, protect concerned citizens, and pave the way for economic development. Now, I'm, I'm not here to discuss the local ordinance at all. That's up to your officials and you. But I'm, I'm here to say what, what we've seen across the state and how other counties across the state are avoiding uh, unintended consequences with very clear language. So the Indiana Land and Liberty Coalition uh, uses a solar ordinance guidebook we, we created where we aggregated uh, the four key categories we've seen areas of differences in counties uh, setbacks, ground covering, screening, and decommissioning across 10 Indiana counties that already have the solar, uh, solar ordinance, and a few of these already have solar projects. So th this is a bit of what we cover. I'll reference back to this, but uh, we, we can see uh, from here, there's various different setbacks. Some counties like St. Joseph, they don't even have setbacks. They just go like, if you can build a barn, then you can build a solar project. From there and other counties such as uh, Shelby County and I think Franklin County have around 650, 660 uh, foot setbacks for primary structures. Uh, so that, that that's just setbacks. But uh, we, we as I said, we aggregated all of this for the four areas of diversion, the divergence, and each ordinance has very different regulations, but none of these ban solar retirement. So it may, it may seem like you want to put mild setbacks or what have you, but no, we, we've not seen any county go through with banning when it were with uh, solar with any ordinance. Uh, and so some of these have actually made whatever projects would come to town much bigger than that actually necessary. So uh, again, I want to reiterate our, our purpose here is to find common ground where it preserves landowner rights, protects concerned citizens, and pays the way for economic development for the community. So, First thing I'm going to touch on are setbacks and ground cover or uh, screening. Uh, the screening is vital for protection uh, for uh, private property rights, uh, along with the setbacks. But with setbacks, uh, it's, it's not like wind development at all, where you can keep pushing it back and essentially ban it. Uh, what, what happens is with solar, the more you extend the setbacks beyond a certain point, the more you increase the size of the project overall. So what we found is around 600 foot setbacks can actually double the necessary acres for solar projects uh, to meet the demands of their power purchase agreement, which is how these pro the projects are constructed. Basically, the utilities have 700 megawatts they want from a project, and the project has to live, deliver that amount of megawatts. It's not a set amount of acres for projects, it's the megawatts. So the more room you put between panels, between properties, the more land you're going to create, uh, being taken up by creating all those dead sticks. So like you can put a thousand, they won't kill a project, it will just increase the amount of land uh, needed to actually produce the power of the project. So what we do, we believe is screening is a much more effective way to protect the property rights of both participants and not participants and reduce the amount of land required for so the last thing anyone wants is to use more land than necessary. So we, we think uh, these effective ordinances that we've seen have a really huge, uh, I mean, say minimal, but reasonable uh, setbacks and high quality screening. So for example, uh, 
So we'll, we'll, we'll hear that we're, we're not an environmental organization. We're here about property rights and everything. We'll see some area, some groups to promote uh, St. Joseph's County Ordinance. It has minimum setbacks uh, possible for this and no screening whatsoever. So we, we, we don't suggest that. We believe there should be screening in the ordinance and that, that is a great way to protect. But some, some counties like um, Shelby County, they, they don't have very good screening, but they put in a bunch of uh, setback, I believe uh, 660 feet. But the other counties on this list, they went somewhere between 50 to usually around 300 setbacks. Uh, and they, they uh, provided all the screening for uh, their county and their non-participants. So we believe this is a happy medium where you're protecting private property rights as a landowner to use their land how they see fit, but you're also protecting non-participants from seeing the project that they don't want to live next to. Then for ground cover, uh, we, we think it's, this is an extremely important part uh, of every ordinance uh, to allow farmland to regenerate while laying fallow, but extreme pollinator mandates can also increase the size and cost of projects, which means less money to the county, less money to the farmer, which is the last thing any of them. So and it also can restrict landowners' rights to use their land for grazing sheep, for agrovoltaics, which is growing crops under, you can grow melons, tomato, all kinds of different stuff under this camp. So we've seen some uh, ordinances, uh, particularly St. Joseph's County again, but a few others that are uh, near the line where uh, if you use specific language, it can cost up to $500,000 per 100 acres uh, for the pollinators if, if they're man mandated native. And uh, the St. Joseph one in particular uh, they require two feet of pollinator coverage for every eight for, for every foot of solar. So that, that would essentially double the size of the project. So it is important not to, while uh, putting in these regulations, have the unintended consequence of expanding the size of the project when most developers we see come in and automatically offer pollinators or sheep grazing or whatever the land will need uh, for their land. And then decommissioning, uh, we, we've seen a lot of that vary a lot by county too, and that's where we get a lot of questions. Uh, so how that works is the companies usually have to provide a bond. The best ordinances we've seen require a surety and performance bond. Uh, and then they allow the county to reevaluate and update the bond every five years. So I, I'm, as we're all dealing with now, with this inflation and increasing in the next five years, the county can come back, adjust it for that. They, they can do all kinds of stuff that they don't think the money's going to cover. So they, this protects the county, makes sure they get the best deal possible, and protect, protects uh, landowners. So but I, I won't take up any more time uh, for all of you. Anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. Or uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, I'll put my email on the slide as well, and I can, I'm happy to connect with anyone after this. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, really want to talk to you about ordinance consider. Our next uh, presenter is Connie Nightingale. She's an economic development consultant with CNC and consultants. Um, she's going to be joining us via WebEx, so if I just switch off. Okay, hey, good evening, everyone. Um, you should be able to hear me and hopefully see my PowerPoint presentation if I can get it to advance here. For some reason, it's not there we go. Okay, um, as was mentioned, I'm Connie Neininger. Um, I am an independent consultant in economic development and renewable energy. A little bit of history. Um, I was the White County Economic Development Director for several years during the development of uh, the second wind farm in Indiana, the Meadow Lake Wind Farm, which now has expanded up to seven different phases and also several other renewable energy projects. And then after that, I went to the Indiana State Department of Agriculture as their economic development director. So working in rural communities, 
And one thing you know, I, I want to talk about is the economic benefits that these types of projects will bring to your rural communities. Economic development in a rural area is very difficult, much more so than most urban or metropolitan areas. You know, many times we're sitting there waiting for the next Honda plant to drop in our laps, but we don't have the infrastructure, we don't have the workforce. There's just a lot of things that are missing that make us attractive to those types of developments. So what we try to do is take a look at what can we use the you know, the res how can we use the resources we have today to benefit our economies in our rural communities? And so renewable energy is one of the, probably the easiest and best ways. And this is a list that comes from Hoosiers for Renewables. Um, I did do some work with Hoosiers for Renewables to help promote renewable energy. And they, like I, are out there trying to help educate uh, local elected officials and the public at large about the facts on renewable energy. We always make sure yeah. the information that we put out there is fact-based, research-based through universities or the National Renewable Energy Lab. And uh, we want our elected officials to have the information so they can make informed decisions. And so a couple of things though, renewable energy is homegrown natural energy. As was mentioned that, you know, many other types of energy sources, they need a raw material. The sun is there for us, the wind is there for us. So let's utilize that resource and put it uh, to use here within our own communities. Also renewable energy, is a low cost reliable energy and I'll go into some more details with that shortly. It does bring local benefits into our communities and it really helps keep Indiana competitive, not just within the state nationally, but also in the global marketplace. So when I talk about the, uh, the cost of renewable energy, uh, back in 2010, you know, we had, a, just a little bit of, of wind energy at that point in time. And it was basically in White and Benton counties. Most of our energy was coming from coal. Over 82% was from coal. And we didn't have any solar then. Well, if we move up to 2019, we see that wind has now jumped up to five and a half percent and still increasing. And solar is now on the, on the rise, but coal has dropped less than 54% of our total energy production today here in Indiana. And, and that's interesting because a lot of people are saying, well, you know, they're blaming renewable energy for this change. This change has been happening for some time because more and more people are, are looking at the environment and how to sustain our communities. And so this, this is not something new. This shift in our energy production has been changing. And so today, if we take a look at the map, and this is actually, uh, they're in the process of updating this map, but if all of these projects were to come online today, uh, we would be able to power over 675,000 homes right here in Indiana. So that's a huge benefit uh, that we can talk about locally grown energy. And so when we do talk about the cost of renewable energy, Again, back to 2009, wind and solar were the most expensive forms of energy production. And at that time, even uh, then coal came next and gas was the least expensive. But if you move up to today's time, 2019, this was a study done by Dr. Michael Hicks at Ball State for Hoosiers for Renewables. We see that that has flipped completely. So now we have coal being the most expensive form of energy production and wind and solar tying for the lowest cost with gas right there in the middle. And so the economics of these projects are really driving this change. And it's happening not just here in Indiana, but across the globe. And there's several companies here that I'm sure you recognize, McDonald's, Ball Corp, Walmart, Google, they are all wanting renewable clean power. 
And so because of that demand, you know, we may have companies looking in our rural communities for a new site, but if we don't have renewable energy in close proximity, they will mark us off the list before we even knew we were on the list. And so that's why it's important for the, our rural communities to look at these opportunities in renewable energy. And they do provide community benefits. It adds to your assessed valuation. It helps decrease our tax rates. And as you all know, you know, when our assessed valuation increases, what generally happens? Our tax rates go down. And I can give you an example here of what happened right in White County uh, when we were starting to work on the, the renewable energy projects here in White County. We were looking at an average tax rate of about a dollar thirty nine per one hundred dollars of assessed valuation. My husband and I actually owned a convenience store in Monticello, which was sixteen miles away from the wind farms, and uh, our daughter was managing that for us. And every year, when she would get the tax bill, she would call and say, "Mom, the taxes went down again for our real estate." And I said, that's thanks to the wind farms. Even though we didn't have a turbine on our property, it still impacted everyone in the county by adding to that assessed valuation and decreasing the tax rates. It allows these communities to make infrastructure improvements, provide enhanced community services, and it does give us economic development opportunities uh, because of these renewable energy projects, whether it's wind, solar, or even biomass. So there's a lot of comments about, um, my goodness, these projects are taking up all of the farmland. And it was mentioned that, you know, people are saying you're taking away our food. Well, as we've heard, not all of what we grow and raise here, especially the crops, are going into our food immediately. And it does get into the supply chain. It does, a lot of it is over 40% is going into the ethanol industry today. But most of the projects that are out there today will be taking up less than 2% of that county's farmland. And so if you're looking, here's an example in Posey County of a $264 million capital investment for a solar project on less than 2% of the farmland, it's bringing in $35 million worth of benefits to that community. And so if you were to take a look at a one acre farm, uh, one acre of farmland today, you know, you might be receiving a couple of hundred dollars in uh, tax revenue from that one acre. But if you end up putting a solar project in there, that same one acre could bring in thousands and even tens of thousands of dollars into your community. And so that's a huge benefit for us. And then, as I mentioned, the assessed valuation. Here's an example of Henry County. In the last five years, Henry County's assessed valuation has dropped more than $57 million. And so if you were to add a $264 million solar project into this community, that would help change that trend. And so those are the things that our local elected officials need to look at when they consider these projects. And then here's a, an actual example from Benton County. Benton County was actually the first county in Indiana to have wind farms. And I will have to say, I was very glad they were first and White County was second because they were able to uh, help us along the way. And that's really what I'm trying to do here through this process. I was there through the development of the wind farms. And now I wanna share those experiences with other counties so you can make it better and make it work for your communities. I'm not here to say you need to do it this way or you need to do it that way. It's about giving you all the information so you can decide what's gonna work best for you. But in Benton County back in 2007, before they, uh, the wind farm started coming online as far as assessed valuation, the top line, the green one, shows the average real estate tax rate in their towns. It was at $3.50 almost. 
And the bottom line is the average overall for the whole county. That was at $2.87 per $100 of assessed valuation. After the wind farm assessments came online, you can move up to 2018 and you can see what happened to those tax rates. The average overall county or town rate went from $3.49 down to $2.73. And then the average rate overall for the county went from $2.87 down to $1.61 for $100 of assessed valuation. That's a huge benefit. And in White County, for our example, we started at $1.39 in our rural communities. The tax rate went down to less than 90 cents for $100 of assessed valuation. So what does that do to help your communities? It helps people who are wanting to build homes. They will have lower tax rates, so it helps them put more money into the actual structure. Companies will have lower tax rates, so they can have more dollars to invest in their workforce and in their community. It makes you more competitive as a community. And so another thing that communities really need to look at, especially the elected officials, is the cost of doing business or what the cost of community services. Larry DeBoer from Purdue University mm -hmm. did a study a while back on the cost of community services. This study is statewide and you can actually pull it up and look at each county's rate. But if we start at the left under the residential tab, for every dollar invested in a residential property, whether it's building a new home or putting a garage on their home, it is going to cost the county or the community a dollar and twenty-three cents to provide all the needed community services. So basically, when people say we want residential development, you need to realize that's costing you more than what it's giving to you. For every dollar invested, it's costing a dollar twenty-three. If you're looking at businesses, retail businesses, even industrial uh, facilities, manufacturing facilities, for every dollar invested, it's costing the community almost 43 cents. So at least you're in the, in the black, you're about halfway there. But for investments going into agricultural areas, whether it's a confined feeding operation or whether it's a wind or solar project, those types of projects only cost the county about 30 cents for every dollar invested. So that's 70 cents that's going into your county coffers to help pay for services in other areas that are needed. And so that's something to take into consideration as you look at these types of projects. And so it does bring even more local impacts uh, for example, a 200 megawatt solar project that's under development today here in Indiana will spend roughly $1 million annually in payroll, supplies, and services. Those are money spent within the community. They're buying gas, you know, they're, they're workers. They look for the workforce within the community so they don't have to drive distances. You know, it helps the overall economic impact of that county. And then I want to talk a little bit about the land use and farmland itself. You know, many people say we're taking this farmland out of production forever. It's never going to go back to farmland. Well, I think I'll argue with them a little bit on that point. First of all, farmers are just like every other business. They need business diversification. And if you ask for any agricultural or crop expert, they say we cannot continue to grow just corn and soybeans in our areas. We have to diversify. And so a solar project especially allows for that diversification. When they put a solar project in, first of all, it's minimal disruption to the soil. They're not putting in cement to hold these tracking systems. They're not putting in rocks to hold the tracking systems. They're pile driving, usually U-channel, down into the ground with nothing else around it that they set the tracking system on and then the solar panels. 
So when it is time to remove the solar field, all they have to do is remove the panels and pull those U channels straight up. And the soil is actually a little bit better than it was before because first of all, it helped aerate the soil. But they do plant different types of vegetation under those panels. Different zoning ordinances in counties require different types of vegetation. I don't know if I can hear you. We lost your audio. Well, the county possibly lose your connection. Okay. All right, let's uh, take a moment here. Uh, see if Connie comes back online. Uh, The challenges of, 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 <laughs> of the internet and not always having really good broadband in different areas of the county, as you probably know. So, um, we'll take a moment here before Connie comes back on. Um, Um, can we can we switch over to uh, another presenter? Yeah, our next presenter is Rich Kirkland. Um, so maybe if I come back on, we'll have her finish up um, doing some really great things, specifically in Indiana. Very nice. But uh, we have Rich Kirkland. He is with the Kirkland Appraisal. He's going to talk about the power of solar facilities. Okay. All right, well, good evening. Um, again, my name is Rich Kirkland. I'm a state certified. Hello? Yeah, I think they switched over to Rich Kirkland now. Okay. I'm really, I'm really not sure what happened, Connie. It was weird. You're doing fine, and then yeah. Okay, if we want to go back to Connie, let her finish up. Is that okay? Okay. Um, I don't know if you hear me, Connie. We're going to go ahead and switch to Rich, and then if we're able to get back to the uh, after Rich is done, we'll do that. Okay. Sorry, we got that easy, Rich. Okay. Um, again, hi. My name is Rich Kirkland. I'm a state certified general appraiser. I'm based in North Carolina, but I'm also certified in Indiana and about six or so other states. I've I've been looking at solar farms and impacts on property values for about 13, 14 years now. In that time, I've looked at over 850 solar farms in about 20 different states. Um, in that time, really, we've been trying to address property value impacts and determine whether or not we can find any um, impacts on adjoining property values and just really looking at where solar farms are located and what the adjoining uses and really capture where, where they are and what they're doing. Um, Again, um, the first thing you have to do when you're asking the question about whether there's an impact on property values, you have to make sure you're answering the correct question. Um, because I do impact analysis for a lot of different things, not just solar farms. I've looked at uh, rock quarries, schools, churches, uh, soccer fields. There, there's a wide range of different things that uh, people have concerns about. Um, so, but the question is, is not, necessarily uh would i rather have what's currently there versus the solar farm the question is really is is what are all the other uses the property currently is approved and can be used for without needing a special use permit um which typically in these areas includes significant residential development agricultural business um and a lot of other similar uses there's a lot of permitted uses that are significantly different than row crops that are already permitted and that's part of the, the category of things that could already go next to them. So that's, that's what we're really looking at. 
Um, when you're looking at these impacts, you're always looking for what's called externalities. Externalities are essentially the things that essentially come off your property, any, any given property, and has an impact on the properties around it. Externalities um, that typically have an impact on property value, the, there's sort of a hierarchy that goes to that. When I look at a wide range of different uh, uses, the number one thing that causes the biggest impact is uh, haz hazardous materials. Anything that can pollute the water, the soil, or the air can have significant impacts on adjoining property values. Um, the next category down, you go and you look at odors and things like that. Uh, things like poultry farms, uh, wastewater treatment plants, solid waste facilities can have impacts like that. And again, next category coming down, you're going to go to noise, things that really disturb uh, the peace and quiet of the area. Um, things like that would be airports, railroads, um, some heavy industries, um, uses of that nature. Um, I've done some outdoor uh, outdoor concert venues that have also had those concerns. Uh, after that, you come down to things that are, you're getting smaller, smaller potential impacts. You start looking at stigma. Uh, things typically is more in the realm of adult establishments. And after that, you have traffic, which um, is, you know, it's really very site specific and determined normally by a traffic engineer. And, and finally, the smallest category that we find is appearance. Um, and all these categories, the only externality that really triggers for a solar farm is appearance. The, uh, there's no hazardous material that gets into the air, water, or soils related to the operation of a solar farm or solar um, uh, fields. There's no, there's no odor associated with it. There's no noise. The traffic coming off of a, these operations is significantly less than what residential development of that property would have. And again, stigma, there's typically not a stigma associated with solar farms that I've ever identified or heard of. Um, there is a certain amount of um, uh, NIMBY that comes up with it, but generally what you hear when you talk to people is, oh, we were like, we were like solar, we're for solar, but maybe not in my backyard. So there's no stigma that we've attributed to that. And appearance is the one category that really comes up again and again in relation to solar farms and, you know, hey, I just don't want to see it. And, um, and that, that follows through into the analysis that we've done. Um, we have done a series of what's called matched pair analysis. It's also called paired sales analysis, where you look at homes and farms that have sold next to existing solar fields. We've been looking at um, this again for uh, over a decade, and we've been tracking sales, uh, just going back to the solar farms we've looked at before. And over time, properties and homes have been selling. And we compare those home sales to similar properties nearby that are not next to a solar farm to see if we can isolate and find any impacts associated with those sales and associated with the solar farm. Um, we currently have roughly 100 or so uh, matched pairs that we've identified looking at different homes. And we've really focused on looking at homes over the fields. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that in a little bit. But homes typically if, are the easiest way to track if there's any impact on property values. There's more, they're more fungible and they're more easy to compare one to another. Um, we've found a wide range of impacts. We, we look at these and we see a, a wide set of data that comes out of the, these 100 sales. We see impacts ranging from a negative 10% impact on adjoining property values all the way up to a plus 10% impact, meaning it enhances value next to it. But when you put these and you chart these, you can see that the vast majority of these results come up sitting right, hovering right around zero. They're all really hovering plus and minus 3%. And again, that's a standard data distribution you'd be expecting. There should be outliers that show, show some negatives and show positives. But 80 to 85% of the data points we find fall right there in that category, right there hovering around zero, showing no impact. Roughly about 5% of the data points we find show a negative impact, and about 10% of the data points we have show a positive impact. Um, so we, we've really been concluding that based on the data involved, we are finding no impact on property values. And um, when we're coming up with it, we should also really talk about some of the, I guess, the measurements we're looking at when we're looking at these adjoining homes next to these solar fields. Uh, we're measuring how close homes are to the solar panels. We, we've measured homes as close as 100 feet. Uh, 
showing no impact on property value. And back in that one case, that was a brand new home built in a new subdivision. That subdivision was built after the solar farm was built and new homes were being built. And the most expensive home in that neighborhood was built 100 feet away from those solar panels. Uh, we found uh, similar developments like that in multiple states where new subdivisions are being developed next to solar farms. Um, in, say, New Jersey, we're looking at 1.6, $1.4 million homes being built 200 feet away from an existing solar farm. Uh, when I, and when I say 200 feet, that's when I measure from the closest point on the panels to the closest point on the home. Um, so, again, getting back to what we were talking about as far as finding no impact on property values, we're looking at appearance being the number one factor to consider. And what, what we're seeing is that enough separation, enough setbacks, you know, coupled with landscape screening helps to mitigate any of those appearance concerns. And um, that, that's been bearing out. When we, we look at these and we do these match pairs, we do the analysis, we also call and try to confirm the sales and talk to the brokers involved. And so far we've interviewed dozens of brokers who have been involved in these sales next to homes at the solar farms. And uh, to date, I haven't had uh, one broker suggest that the solar panels had any impact on the sales price or the marketing. And they confirmed that what I'm finding in the data is that uh, there are uh, segment of buyers out there who are very happy to buy next to solar panels and see it as a way of buying a home that's backing up to a protected, quiet neighbor. Um, they, you know, the option, the alternative is oftentimes you're backing up either to fields that may be turned into a subdivision, or you buy a home that already wraps up to houses. And again, the solar fields provide privacy and a quiet neighbor. Um, and this is not just the, the findings that I'm finding. Um, we've looked at a number of university studies that are out there. There's a study that uh, one of the earlier ones that came out in about 2018 was a study out of Texas. It was really a study identifying where solar farms are located. And it really unsurprisingly located, found that most of them are located in rural areas with low population densities. But the second part of that study was really a survey of appraisers across the country asking the question, what impacts have you been seeing next to solar farms? That survey uh, came out and it shows a, a pretty broad, broad range of impacts that the appraisers identified. They show everything ranging from about a minus 30% impact to a plus 10% impact. But one of the questions they put in there is they asked the appraisers who were doing the survey, have you ever appraised anything next to a solar farm? And when they look at the results and split it based on those things, the appraisers who identified as having no experience appraising next to a solar farm, they're the ones who identified minus 30% to minus 20% impacts. The appraisers who identified having actually appraised something next to a solar farm came in with impacts running from about minus 4% to plus 10%. So there was a significant disconnect between appraisers who have experience around solar farms and those who have no experience and were essentially guessing. Um, the conclusion of that study and the researchers was that the solar farms were having minimal to negligible um, impacts on property value and that more results were suggesting positive impacts than negative. Um, there's another study that's come out of the University of Rhode Island, and I've interviewed the lead researcher with that. That, that one comes up a lot because the abstract clearly identifies that they found negative impacts around solar farms studied in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, you know, going out to, I forget the radius, but it's a, a couple mile radius. Um, however, those were in high population density areas. They found that this was an impact they discovered in these high population suburban areas. And even in their analysis, they found that in areas where the population was under 2000 people per square mile, and what they identified as rural areas, they found no impact on property values in those areas. They even identify in the study itself that it is likely that the the results of that study aren't very transferable to other states, given that the population densities in the areas being considered were significantly higher than most other areas. But they also suggested that part of that impact may have been not the solar panels themselves, but the actual fact that there's so little vacant space in those areas that the loss of that green space would have had an impact regardless. Um, so again, the in rural areas, the University of Rhode Island study is supporting a finding of no impact on property value. There's another study that came out of the University of Georgia that was specifically was looking at agricultural land in North Carolina, and they actually found a positive relationship associated with agricultural land related to solar farms. That there was a clear indication that farmland near 
and here the power lines were actually increasing in value after a solar farm came in. Um, so again, the, the university studies are uh, providing a pretty consistent support, kind of coming up with very similar conclusions to what I'm finding through my matched pair analysis. So um, again, we've typically seen these things. Most of the solar farms we've looked at have been in very rural areas. Um, and um, let's see, we've also done some surveys talking to assessors where solar farms have been very active. North Carolina, we've had solar farms for over 10 years, and we've surveyed and um, queried all the assessors in the state to find out how they're treating properties next to it, because they have to keep track of this and look at that. Um, right now, um, of all the assessors I've been able to get responses from, we have zero responses suggesting there's been any negative impacts related to solar farms, and we've had several that suggested positive impacts. Same thing in Virginia, we've uh, identified uh, all the counties where they have solar activity already, and we've been speaking to those and the assessors there again have declared all the responses we've had have been po positive saying no impacts on property value with one or two responses saying that they saw a potential for positive, but they haven't seen any actual positive. Um, so uh, again, that, that's sort of what we've been seeing and what we've been looking at. And uh, again, I'll be happy to answer questions later as needed. Okay, I've got my video on, but if it starts, uh, give me a signal if something starts happening and I'll shut the vid my video off and just use the sound for right now. But, and, but I won't show the PowerPoint. So I was talking about the, the land use and you know the farmland benefits and the diversification of the land for the farmers and how they, some of them can graze their sheep under there, again, working with a solar project early on in the process, you, the farmers and landowners can let the developer know what it is they want to do with this, uh, this project. So if they do want to graze sheep or if they want to raise certain pollinator, you know, have a pollinator habitat, it's important to communicate with them. The other thing about uh, the solar projects, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of the land set aside program, the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, CREP, where the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, pays farmers to set aside so many acres for years, sometimes up to 15 years, and actually they've just extended that up to 30 years, and they get paid for not growing crops on that land. Well, a solar project is basically a CREP program, but it's not paid by our tax dollars and the federal government. It's paid by a private company. And so that's important to remember that, yes, these projects can be taken out and then they can go, be, go back to farmland. And I've had solar specialists tell me that the soil is much better after a solar project has been in there because you're not using all the chemicals, you're, you know, the compaction of the soil with your equipment over it is much less and it really does help. If there's drainage tiles, the developer is responsible for repairing any tiles and they wanna minimize the impact to wildlife also. And so it's important, again, the communication with the developer between the county officials and landowners is very important through this project. And so as you, oops, um, as you think about these things, uh, there's a couple of examples I wanted to share. 
in Randolph County, they have a wind farm already in operation. They have a solar project that is still under construction, but it's already producing power. And the best part that they see is they worked with the developer on an economic development agreement. Now, almost every type of project out there has an economic development agreement, whether it's a manufacturing facility um, that spells out what the company is going to do and what the county is going to provide. Well, with the renewable energy projects, they can work out an economic development payment that will come into the county. Money will come to the county early on in the process. And in White County, we considered that the lost opportunity. So in other words, we know once a wind farm or a solar project goes in, we're not going to have any more houses built in that area. But these dollars that can come in up front, the economic development payments can be used to provide grants to your taxing units, your schools, they can help provide scholarships to students. They can help with infrastructure improvements. And all of this is going to, um, it's not going to impact negatively your tax revenue if you call it an economic development payment. And so that's where we like to come in and talk with communities about the types of agreements that you should work on with these projects. And so for example, in Randolph County, They've got their projects already. They used a million dollars to replace the school, the bleachers at the elementary school. They resurfaced their track. They uh, replaced their playground, upgraded their locker room, and they have a new roof and chiller on their schools. And that's all from the renewable energy projects. In um, also Randolph County and in Benton County, they are using some of their economic development payments to spread broadband across the county. Randolph County is using $4 million of their project funds to put broadband out there to all their residents. Benton County is actually doing a three county project with their funds and delivering 75% uh, of their population will receive fiber direct to their homes. These projects wouldn't happen without the renewable energy projects. And so there's, as a county and county officials, there's four agreements that you should consider as you start to think about these projects. The economic development agreement that's going to spell out what the company's gonna do, how much they're going to invest, how many employees, if you're going to offer tax abatement or what you want in return for them being there. The road use and ditch maintenance agreement, in other words, to make sure the roads are not going to be damaged um, White County actually has over 60 miles of brand new heavy haul county roads, and they did not pay one penny out of their pockets for it. And that was because of these agreements that they worked with on the developers. A vegetation plan. And I, I encourage communities, don't use an example from another county and just drop it in and put your name in it. Talk with your landowners. Talk with your soil specialist about what works the best for your community and your soils. And then the, the fourth agreement is a decommissioning plan. Every contract a developer signs with a landowner will have a decommissioning plan that if, you know, if the project no longer is uh, producing energy, you know, they have to remove all the components and they have a certain amount of time. In most cases, the county should also have a decommissioning plan that sort of is an umbrella over the county uh, to help protect the landowners uh, and make sure that the project is decommissioned to your satisfaction. And again, these are agreements where you spell out how the company is going to pay for these things, not how the county is going to pay for them. And those are very important to remember as you go through this process. And so I mentioned White County, which is where I live. Uh, we have over seven phases, which have invested $1.2 billion in capital investment. That's billion with a B. They've received over $11 million in local government payments. And the landowners 
have received $50 million in landowner payments since the inception of these wind projects. And one of the things that the White County was able to do, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Indiana Beach, but here actually in 2020, just at the beginning of the pandemic, Indiana Beach announced that they were going to shut down. They were gonna close for good. The county was able to use some of their wind farm economic development funds, $3 million to help entice a new buyer. And they actually gave that money to the buyer as an incentive to buy the beach. The beach was sold, it reopened, and it's been opened ever since. So those are things that can be done. There's flexibility in these projects and how you spend those monies. So I did want to share the Hoosiers for Renewables website. Uh, it's www.hoosiersforrenewables.com. There's a wealth of information out there. Um, I'll be sure that Catherine and, and the county has my contact information. If you have any questions about what we've talked about or anything that you know, I can help refer to other sources or to provide information, I'm happy to help. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and this media flexibility. Thank you all for being flexible and giving the audience for being very patient. I know this is can sometimes be frustrating and for new people who are coming online, um, we can really thank you as well. Um, I also want to do before we get to our question and answer session, just um, thank each of our speakers, John and Connie and Rich, for sharing their perspective and their experience. We really appreciate you being here this evening to do that. Um, whether that's here or virtually. Um, I also want to thank Marion High School and um, their IT department for helping us this evening and for Grand County um, and for their IT department for their assistance as well. So we're going to open it up to questions. Um, we were actually able to reach for quick break. We have about half an hour here for questions. And if you're here in the audience so that our um, call the album capture your voices, if you can come to where that pink line is um, and uh, just let us know. Yep, right there, let us know what your question is. Um, and just for time's sake, if you kind of keep it to a minute or two for your question, and then we'll see um, who can best answer that question for you and have them um, speak up. So there may be a little bit of challenge as far as the audio and doing this in person and online. So again, I appreciate your patience. That. If you're online, you can just go ahead and type your question into the chat um, and you have my colleague or, or one of our folks from Grant County can help us out and make sure that those um, questions are heard as well. Yes, please. Hi, one of my questions um, that I had. Why Indiana? Um, you know, why why solar in Indiana? I, I get wind farm, always windy in Indiana, but I've heard of statistics saying that we only have approximately 84 actual sunny days throughout the year in Indiana. And with solar, it looks like to me, I know you do capture some energy off the solar on sunny days, but there are other parts of the country that have a lot more sunnier days. Say, for example, Southwest and Las Vegas, where it was Los Angeles, got a lot more days throughout the year that are sunny. So, why why Indiana? Why that area? This is Connie Nininger. I'll, I'll provide a, a short response and then let somebody else too. Uh, yes, out west or southwest, they do have a lot more sun possibly. But first of all, these solar arrays today don't need bright shiny shiny sun every moment to be producing power so it could even be overcast just like you get sunburn when it's overcast so they will still be receiving some of the power from the sun but more important is our grid system out west they don't have the grid system to take that power to where it needs to be used and that's one of the greatest advantages about Indiana is we actually are connected to two different grid systems, as was mentioned earlier, MISO and the PJM. So we could take the power that we produce here 
and use it here in Indiana and also share it in other areas that need the power. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate what Connie said. She, she's exactly right. Uh, if, um, when the uh, solar panels now, they're bifacial. So, uh, like you mentioned, they can collect some, every ray of sunlight for, for all the nutrient spectrum on both sides now, uh, even on lacking days. And then, as Connie mentioned, we're in the middle of the ISO grid and the PKM grid, which I mentioned in my, uh, my presentation. And uh, as the electrons get shipped across uh, on the grid system, as I mentioned, Southwest is uh, not as built out as it is here in the Midwest and, the cross and in the crossroads of America here. Uh, so we, we have a lot better grid system and electron as it is moved across the country, it's it's less powerful, essentially. So the closer it's used to home, the more energy you're actually going to need to utilize on the grid. So in, in, for in Cass County, for example, where they just approved a solar farm, uh, that, that will be used in the local area. We're not sure exactly yet where it will go, but as it's put onto the grid, it will be to the closest area possible uh, to get the best use out of the grid. So uh, right now, Indiana is buying a lot of renewable energy and it's getting transported in from the Dakotas. And as it travels, we're getting, we're getting less of the energy. So if we can produce more homegrown energy here, we're going to produce more that we can put directly onto the grid, get Hoosiers more power, and then also develop the communities on the tax base generation. But one thing I'd like to maybe clarify, clarify a little bit, you know, I've heard it mentioned a couple of times throughout the meetings, you know, talk about farmers that's got, that's got ground to send, set aside from the government programs, whether that be filter strips, waterways, but those are typically less productive acres, so not the best quality ground. And that could be any parts of the county or it could be just on a farmer's land. If he farms 2,000 acres, he might have 100 out of that 2,000 that's not high productive soils, whatever. So he may put that in a set aside. It might be a filter strip, whatever, along the creek bank. But it seems like the solar panels, the solar farms are always going on the best quality farm ground. And so I want to make sure we're, we're, not, we're not really comparing apples to apples there. I mean, but you talk about how farmers are already kind of set its ground off, but there's a reason why. And when we're talking about solar panels, it doesn't, you know, it seems like it's always the best quality dirt that I see that's being put in. Especially when you talk about Northwest Indiana, that's good quality land in that area. I used to sell seed. Uh, I know that land very well. Just wanted to clarify that. <laughs> I think you make some very good points there that um, there it's not an equal comparison sometimes, but on the other side of that, you know, this is the, the farmer's land and what we have been seeing across the state is farmers have been struggling. Um, you know, just growing corn and soybeans does not always make uh, make ends meet for them. And I've had several farmers tell me that they would have lost the farm if it hadn't been for these renewable energy projects because they could not continue to farm even their couple hundred acres because of the cost of production, cost of uh, operation. And so this, for many of these farmers, it's a, a business decision. They're making this decision based on economics and they can get more money per acre from a solar project than they can growing most crops or livestock here today. I argue that and that's a landowner. Okay? That's a landowner whether he farms it or not. But if you're a tenant farmer, <laughs> that's a whole different story because then you're taken completely out of the picture. So if you farm a thousand acres and most of that's rented ground and say three, four hundred acres gets taken out of your area, for solar panels, what's that farmer do? Because he doesn't own that ground, and he's certainly not going to capture the benefits from that solar. Panel. So there's kind of there's two sides to that story too. I agree. Yes, there is. One other quick question, and I'll sit down. <laughs> Where are these panels made? What country? Who manufactures these panels? Um, so uh, it is made all over uh, the world. Uh, there's actually a plant called First Solar in Ohio that manufactures it here. And I, I can't speak to any of the companies that are here, may or may not be here. Are they US they made or are they China? Well, I think they're, they're made all over. A lot are made in South Asia. Uh, but I, I, I do believe in Grant County. I, I won't speak for uh, local officials, but it has been quoted that they would ban uh, 
solar made in China for solar. I, I, I think that's a great idea. I haven't seen that used in, in any other county, but I think that's an innovative idea to make sure that we're using the best panels from the county. Thank you. So I just sorry, just really quickly to follow up. I have um, a couple of resources here that I didn't. Uh, Ton of copies, but um, one of them is our frequently asked, frequently asked questions and answers, and it talks a lot about why certain kinds of models chosen for solar projects. Um, so this might have some information that you might be interested in. And then in regards to um, panels being made outside of the U.S., and there are different types of panels, so. Um, you know, you need to be cognizant of which types of panels might be used. Um, so, I know a lot of times, sometimes, or sometimes, the concern about panels has to do with its safety and concerns about environmental safety, and, and therefore concerns about where they're constructed and how they're constructed, which are all great questions. So, another source I would like to share is this is the health and safety impact of solar um, photovoltaics, and this is from NC, NC State University. And so this talks a lot about um, concerns that people might have about what are the components in, um, in one of these panels. Do I need to be worried about them? That sort of thing. So this also has some really great information. So I'd like to talk about that and how to give those as well. Um, in fact, I'll set a few here down the stage. Catherine, you're a nonprofit, correct? Yes. What percentage of your donors would you say directly benefit from the development and construction of solar energy? I don't know the answer to that. I'm happy to give that for you or, or share with you that for you. Um, our executive director was going to be here this evening and she could answer that, so I apologize, but I, I just do not have the information for you. What natural weather events have the greatest negative impact on solar farms? Um, what natural weather events have the greatest negative impact on solar farms? Richard, how do you make past insights in that one? If if I'm understanding the question correctly um so in other words a hail storm or tornado um is that correct that's what i'm asking you okay okay i wanted to make sure i understood the question correctly yeah um yes if there's a hail storm there could be some damage to the the actual panels but the way they're made um it's almost like your cell phone you know if it cracks it's not going to shatter glass and throw it everywhere. It's it's going to because it's encased in a in a covering. It's multiple layers um, with the components inside the um, and I can't think of the right word I'm wanting to use right now, but it, inside of other layers. And so it, there's no liquid in there. Um, the electronic components are inside. Yes, it could shatter. They probably wouldn't leave that panel out there. They would replace it, which is really easy to do with solar projects. They can go in and replace those panels if they should get cracked because they wouldn't want uh, it to decrease the production overall. Uh, the wind turbines, uh, we actually had a tornado go through White County. It did not affect the turbines whatsoever. Um, they again because of the structure the way they're made um, if the wind is blowing over 50 miles an hour they do shut down the turbines automatically uh, because it, that is detrimental to the braking system inside and to the gears um, but again probably the rain washes them off those are going to be the most the main things that are going to happen here within uh, Indiana if a tornado hits a solar project, it's going to be about the same type of damage that could occur to your house with the roof blowing off. Um, any other, Jonathan, any other comments on that? 
Um, I just want to say that in um, that uh, resource that I put there, one of the things that it mentions is that our solar panels are constructed to withstand um, up to 150 mile per hour winds. And I have visited smaller installations that have also um, experienced like an F1 level tornado and had no damage to the large solar installation. In the event that there would be a solar farm failure, who's accountable for addressing that issue? Can you explain what you mean by solar farm failure? Who manages? Who who oversees in the in the event that something would occur that would create an issue? Do you, do you mean to say like if there was a natural disaster? Correct. Or is okay. a failure at um, any? Right, so whatever company is operating. There, is there staffing available to oversee the yes. solar farmers that out there on its own doing its thing until somebody recognizes a problem? No, they do. They do have staff on site. They will hire a certain number of people and that will be listed in the economic development agreement. How many people they will have on location there to maintain and watch over the project. Year round. Correct. Crop reserve uh, land, CRP ground, at, from a farmer's perspective, is placed in CRP for a reason, and that's due to its limited productivity. It appears that Indiana is being targeted for solar due to the fact that we have two grids going through our state. And regard, I guess my question would be, are solar companies targeting the ground that's not as productive as the flat soils in Grant County, where that grid is going through, or are we being targeted due to the, the benefit of the solar company developing the solar farms in the areas that's most beneficial for them. And why don't we have an initiative to try and get infrastructure targeted towards our less productive soils, which are CRP that's already set aside, rather than target productive soils where we're agricultural producing? Is that on anybody's plate to try and do that? The, the challenge, and you, you hit on it, is where is the infrastructure located? Because that's for any type of renewable energy, pro any type of energy production, it has to be located next to the grid system, next to a substation, so they can put get the power to those who need it. Um, and so some of the, the challenges there is, you know, first of all, where's the grid system? And that's what's driving the location of many of these projects. As far as, you know, trying to kind of reverse that trend and target the areas with infrastructure so it can attract those. Um, updating and upgrading our grid system is very costly. Uh, it costs a mile, a uh, million dollars to run one mile of high power lines. And that's not talking about your substation or anything else. And most utilities, if they do that, they're going to pass that cost on to us, the consumers. And, and so right now that isn't, um, isn't something that I see happening, but I think that's something that you could talk with your legislators about to see if it's it's feasible. I, Jonathan or anyone else want to comment there? Rich, if he's still online. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to, to reiterate on this point, the, these projects, they aren't going out looking for productive farmland to just take up. They're looking where the interconnections are, where they can put it onto the grid most efficiently to the least cost for the right payer. So uh, the thing is, uh, like, the farmers are the people, the landowners are the people that are deciding this. If they, if they, we can argue all day about if we can put it on the CRP 
acres, which are going to be scattered throughout the county, and that's going to cost a lot more to make all that connect together. But the farmers, if they think they have productive farmland and they don't want it in the pocket, they can just say no. There's nothing the developers can do about it. So, like, I, I, I'd rather not we take up farmland, but as, as we were saying, it's going to be less than 2% uh, of the county, or the, the usually the projects are less than 2% of the county's total farmland, and even if all projects in the state are built, which they aren't going to be, it would be less than 2% of Indiana's farmland. So, it, it's it, it, essentially, it's up to the farmers to say no if, if they think the farmland is as productive as as you're saying. So, I... I, I, I'm not saying the problem line isn't productive, but it's it's up to the farmers to refuse and the landowners to refuse that if they think it's going to affect that. But you, usually, but 98 percent of the town farmland is still there, so it's up to the private landowner. A suggestion that I would make for your presentation is: we don't live in a rose garden, and I'm sure there's issues associated with solar energy. It might be beneficial to throw some of those in as well. Be my suggestion for your presentation. Um, and is this way we can follow? I don't know if you um, like contact information. Yes. Yeah, so we've read recently a few projects. One is in like Muncie. They're taking an old industrial site, former GM plant, and building a solar farm on that. It's been used for nothing. Uh, this is a really probably good development. Are we looking at any of these kind of sites? Instead, uh, another business in Muncie built a small solar farm behind their business on some unused ground, kind of cleaned up the area put in a little solar farm and it was to power their business. Do we think we have to have large farms that get on the grid? Can't we build something that we use locally that actually benefits us without putting farming business out of business on that land, shutting down one business, putting in another business, can't we use something that wasn't productive to begin with? It, it seems like a waste. Also, I mean, farmland is sown to agriculture. And in our comprehensive county plan, it says to protect our farmland. So it seems to go against what we're expected to do. Does anybody have any comments? Yeah. I think we should do this and not do smaller projects. Why do we have to do big projects getting on the grid? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I think there's some things we discussed about in regards to how large we can build them, and we have to remain under one as far as to change um, how those projects are classified. So for the larger scale projects, we are looking for in order to build the amount of megawatts that they need to supply into um, into the demand, right? Or that's being needed by the utilities. So that's part of it. Um, but I think that there are a number of different um, companies working at different levels on solar projects throughout the you know, small scale or the utility scale. Um, in regards to using the land, you know, using farmland for utility scale solar, it really is a business decision for the, the farm landowner or the farmer to determine whether that's the kind of production or beans, or do they want to produce energy? So it can be seen as an opportunity for them as well. Of course, you understand, you're talking about a utility. I'm not talking about agricultural use. That is not an agricultural use. That is electric generation. It's a utility. It's not zoned for farming. 
not agriculture. We do have zoning laws. This seems to run totally against it. And people who own agriculture land know what it's zoned for. It's like people who live in a residential neighborhood. Oh, it's not zoned for, uh, say, a business. Like, you uh, can't just move diesel truck repair shop in next to somebody's home in a subdivision. It's not zoned that way. I don't know if Connie can answer some of the questions about zoning. Do you have any insights to that or not? When it comes to zoning, I mean, most of these projects, the solar projects are going into agriculturally zoned areas. They do not have to change the zoning on those areas as long as your your zoning ordinance doesn't require it. Um, so they are still classed in most counties zoned agricultural. Um, as far as the the wind farms are different than the solar projects on the solar projects i know they they passed um and i'm going to mess up the numbers senate uh, state senate bill was it 1348 last year on the assessment and how solar projects are to be assessed they put a minimum out there so that way, again, what you see happening with agricultural lands versus agricultural lands with solar projects on them, uh, the assessed valuation is much greater. They, they've they set a minimum there uh, that helps the county and helps everybody, even the developer, understand how much is in taxes they're going to be paying. But what happens with some counties to ensure that the taxes do not go down because tax laws can change, as we all know, not only in, in their economic development agreement do they include an economic development payment, but they also include a pilot payment that if tax laws should change, that would decrease the amount of tax revenue coming into the county that the developer agrees to pay the difference so the county will still be whole as far as the new tax levy that's coming into the county. So there's agreements there that help to ensure the tax levies that are coming in meet what the county is, is expecting. And I and I know I probably didn't answer that question completely, um, because it a lot of it is still solar projects are still new at this point in time, but they are going into ag zoned areas. If that helps, some ordinance to do that, or you would have to have a special exception by the board of zoning appeals. That would be the normal process. Some counties are doing special exceptions, some are not. White County does not require a special exception as long as a wind or solar project is going into agricultural lands. They do not require a special exception. So every county is different. Um, and uh, it's being driven by the landowners. Uh, I mean, White County landowners wanted these projects. And I know there was a question about how many landowners. I, I don't have the number in my head, but I know right now the wind farms are covering over 80,000 acres in White County. That's about 25% of the county's total land mass. And they are now in the process of approving three different solar projects, about 2,000 acres each, to go into the county around the wind farms. So those are, um, again, it, it's a county decision. and. But it's a county decision based on what the landowners who own that land, you know, what their preference is. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that you have to really take into consideration as, as you look at your zoning ordinance and the process you're wanting to go through. And we ask our landowners the question, do you want these projects? And we were in a room, a, an auditorium at the high school, and it was filled in every Farmer stood up and said, yes, we want these projects. So, you know, the county made their decisions based on that. Okay, no further questions. Um, do we have any questions online that haven't been answered or that need to be addressed? And 
Any questions from online that we need to address? Can you hear me? Yes. I had a question. Uh, you said that we, we produce more crops than more corn is for the ethanol than what's right now. But has there been any studies to know where that's going to be in 20 to 30 years from now? Yeah, could you, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one more time, please? My question, my question was, uh, you guys spoke to, uh, on corn, how much is used for ethanol, and that we need more of a supply than what's used. I wanted to know if there's a study 20 to 30 years from now, if we're still producing what we need, or there's a, we have a abundance. Not aware of any specific studies at this point in time. I know Purdue University is watching these things closely. Um, in fact, they're looking at doing some economic impact studies on the solar projects. Um, but they need to get these projects up in, in operation so it would be pertinent. We've got studies from other states, but we want it specific to Indiana. So they're trying to work on getting, uh, once these projects, the larger scale projects come online, um, they're ready to move forward with studying the, the economic impact overall. And um, I know there's uh, some studies from Michigan that have talked about, you know, the loss of ag production, but that study from the University of Michigan, the professor we've talked to has actually even said, but I, this is a one sided study. I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, the loss of ag, but I'm not talking about the replacement from the solar project. So it's not really a, a good study that we can use to compare to today because it's, it's just talking about one side of the project. Um, and so I think as more projects come online here in the Midwest, you know, Purdue is watching this closely and I know they're doing a study right now. They're gathering data on all of the zoning ordinances out there around the state of Indiana and working to get those out there online. So, so different counties can see comparisons. Um, but yeah, it's, um, what we see happening and, and what I, from my time with the Department of Ag, we see changes happening. Again, the commodity crops that are just set there, you know, to be shipped out away from the state of Indiana or even away from the country, we see changes happening in agriculture. Some farmers are looking at doing more specialty crops, um, which, you know, they don't, won't be probably planting, you know, 2000, acres of a specialty vegetable uh, because there's they're more labor intense but those are the types of plantings that can actually do well around solar projects they're they're actually growing some now with they're putting tomatoes or or uh, pumpkins or different vines down around the solar arrays um, they're also talking about grow 
growing more and more crops, vegetables and fruits in uh, elevated greenhouses, uh, what they have different names for them, indoor farms where they're industrial type uh, shelving that's growing multiple layers of vegetables. We see more and more of that happening. So to say, you know, it, what is, what are we losing versus what it's going to look like in 20 years? Um, if I had a, you know, a silver bullet and could hit the target, I, I would definitely be doing that. But I, I'm not aware of anyone at this point in time who wants to uh, project. We just know we have to keep changing. We have to diversify what we're doing because it's, um, everybody's changing. The environment's changing. Uh, I, agriculture's uh, changing. I understand what you're saying, but a lot of what was being driven was about the money and the revenue that the county could get. Uh, I just got uh, some budget numbers to put out a court. So you said 80,000 acres up there in White County. Uh, it costs about $538 to put a corn crop out. So if I was in that county, I would look at spending about $42 million just for this year in my local economy. Is that not taken in consideration? I mean, we, we hear these numbers of how much the county is going to gain, but I'm just wondering on 80,000 acres, that's how much that local economy receive if a farmer farmed all that ground. Yeah, so so the White County, that, that's a big farm. They actually farm all their So it's not exciting to that they're still farming. So, so it's, say it's 2,000 acres. I'm just saying with the, the amount of money that farmer spends in a particular land to put a crop out in the local economy where he's buying his local fertilizers, chemicals, his diesel fuel for modern pop operations, that all has to, it's not, it's not a win for solar or a win for farming. It has to be equal playing field as far as revenue for the county. Okay, so when you say, uh, you said it was roughly $543 to put an acre out? 538. Okay, and so if they've got 2,000 acres, that's just roughly over a million dollars. Correct. Okay, so, but you mentioned the number of 42 million. Where was that number coming from? That was from? on your, your 80,000 acres of, that you have oh, up okay. in White County, you said. Okay, well, um, if yeah. unless that 40, 80,000 acres, are they farming two thirds of that ground? Yes, they are farming some of it. Um, and so there, there is still revenue coming in from some of that from the farm, but just uh, as far as the tax rates, the assessed valuation, um, you know, White County, uh, first of all, didn't have to worry about the tax caps or any of that hitting them. So they, they have been actually uh, in very good financial shape because of the renewable energy projects. They, um, the tax revenue is the main thing that comes in uh, from those projects because of the capital investment. You know, if, if, when you're talking $1 billion plus of capital investment into a rural community of 25,000 people, um, there's no other project that even comes close to that, including farm operations. Uh, who owns those, that, who owns that particular uh, structures? Who owns the, the wind farm? Or? Yes. Okay, that, that's owned by EDP Renewables. Um, Where are they out of? They are out of Portugal, but they, they have corporate offices now in, in the US since that time when they first started it was out of a, a, it was a Portugal company, but now they have uh, quite a bit of investment here and they have their uh, moved a corporate office here into the US now. So when you went through the process and then raise any dealing with a, a country coming to this area? No, because um, we, we liken it to almost uh, the majority of manufacturing facilities that are out there uh, many of them are owned by 
non-US companies, Subaru, you know, Indiana Packers, uh, they're all owned by non-US corporations. Um, and a lot of the investments that we have seen happening um, have been from international companies here in Indiana when it comes to large scale economic development projects. So in 35 years, do you think they will still be the same company that owns that? Uh, they did sell once, but the, the, uh, they changed their name. They, when the company first started in White County, it was called Horizon Wind. Then EDP Renewables came in and bought them out. EDP has been there for 13, going on 14 years now. Um, and they've, uh, they're good neighbors. How and I think that's, sell? what do they sell? How quick did they sell? Oh, that, that probably happened within the first year or so when, before it was even up in operation. Uh, when uh, they Horizon Wind basically was acquired by EDP Renewables. So once again, that didn't flags through the project that they sell within one year. No, because again, we had the agreements that, again, as long as you write your agreements and you're covered. As far as the successors and successors and assigns. Um, they still have to abide by the same agreements, but the people were the same. The people didn't change. Uh, the same people that were there managing it are, you know, were still there after the sale. Um, again, how many corporations do you have out there that have sold out? And, you know, that some of them that you don't even know about. Um, that happens, unfortunately, every day. Yeah, so I, I agree. Just asking questions. About oh, yeah, your yeah. particular project that, you know, there are things that happen that start off that way. So I was just asking that question. And, and I think that's why it's important to have the agreements rock solid as best as you can. We use Barnes and Thornburg um, out of Indianapolis to help write those agreements. And um, they have been very, uh, very supportive of the community as far as how those agreements were written. Uh, a lot of input from the county officials um, before we signed any of those agreements. And, and I encourage every community, get an attorney that understands these types of projects um, and get a financial advisor that understands some of the questions that we're asking, what's gonna happen if, what's gonna happen down the road? With your local import, input, do you know of a, a, a manufacturing facility that's going to be coming in? Make sure they take that into consideration when they calculate your financial impact. Do you know of a manufacturer or another company that's going to be closing its doors? You need to be taking those things into consideration as you look at the financials and the impacts of these types of projects. So it, it's not a, yeah, let's just sign here and go with it. It, it takes a lot of research. And um, I think the more you can talk with the project, we had one person that was responsible as the liaison between the county officials, the developer, and the landowner. At that time, it was myself. I was the economic development director. So we made sure everyone stayed in the loop uh, of what was happening, discussions that were going on. And I think that really made a huge difference of, of how those projects turned out and how they're still turning out today. The fact that EDP is now building a solar project in White County after building seven phases of wind farms. Um, I think it, uh, communication, I cannot stress enough. Thank you, Connie, thank you for the questions online. We, um, I wanna honor everyone's time, so we would end at eight o'clock. So we have one last question here, um, and then we'll go ahead and uh, finish up this evening's chat. Okay, um, actually it's more than one, so I'll try to run through them. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so all of the electricity that's that's going to be manufactured is going to go off into the grid, and it's not going to benefit or lower our electric bills, right? Am I understanding that right? 
these types of projects, they have to, because of the volume of electricity, they cannot put it into our homes. It would blow our homes up because of the vast amount of power. So it goes into the grid and they have to do a, what they call a power purchase agreement where the utilities buy it. So like in White County, many of the, the electrons that are produced here, renewable energy electrons are being purchased by NIPSCO, Northern Indiana Public Service Company. So they are staying in the area. Now to say that one electron that's being produced at this site is going to stay here, that's not quite the way power works. It's a commodity, it's sold on the open market many times too. So um, the amount of po power that's being produced has to go onto the main grid lines. It cannot go onto these smaller electrical lines that feed our homes. That would make us want to have the smaller uh, solar farms than the large ones in our area. Uh, but that would be a question for your utility provider. Who's providing that power to you today and how much power do they need? Right. Uh, and one of the things that we had talked that a uh, gentleman talked about earlier was using land that is not prime farm land. Uh, and we've got a lot of deserted factory land in Grant County. So I would like to see that. I also would like to see um, some of the, like, like Walmart uh, distribution and Dollar General distribution uh, create in their parking areas, create uh, carport type situations and, you know, they can provide their own electricity. Um, and then get off onto something else. Um, okay, so then when we saw the video, the gentleman speaking said, okay, the fence is here to keep animals and people out. And then we're talking about having animals grazing, people uh, gathering crops up. You know, how how is that going to work? Having people not supposed to be in there, but yet you tell them they can. The, the people they're trying to keep out are the vandals and those who want to do harm to the area. Um, and just like when it comes to wildlife, and I go back to the communication component, for the county and the landowners to speak with the developer and work through this process, we have one project where a landowner said, you know what, I've got a lot of deer is there any way we can open up a, a deer run to where they open up a, a tract in the between the fences to where deer can run straight through um, from one uh, wooded area to another? And again, the developer said, "Well, sure." Again, talking with the the uh, developer as they work through this project and lay it out is important. Um, and so. Again, if that agreement is made up front with the landowner and the developer, then the agreement's there, it's in writing, and they know what wants, what is to be done. It's the ones who are there when they shouldn't be is, is their concern with the fencing. And plus, you're talking about electricity, and so you don't want just anyone running through there. They need to be conscientious of it, just like you know we have to watch little kids around our stoves and our electrical outlets. And so you mentioned the deserted factory land. Yes, there are opportunities there. And we actually have a developer, uh, a company here in Indiana that did an 80 acre uh, solar project and greenfield site in Kokomo um, on a, a brownfield site from an old factory. And so there are some of those projects that are happening but again, it, it depends on the power, the, the power demand, and you know who's going to buy that power from them. They were talking also about when it's all decommissioned, uh, it's just a matter of pulling the poles up. My understanding is there may be some cables 
uh, some cement foundation type things in the ground. Is that wrong? The or only oh, the only cement <laughs> is where at the inverter box. the The tracking the the tracks of solar panels do not have cement in the ground. Cables. Uh, most of those. Oh, somebody else wants to answer that. Ordinance, whatever they negotiate, they like, usually they do. I've, I've seen some counties have like a certain debt, but usually I, I can't speak to what right counties do, but usually they some care of the payments. So that needs to be an ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's the worst of what I know. So. Okay, this will have to be our, our last question for the evening. Well, uh, my understanding is they will and have caught on fire. Or who subsidizes the fire department, fire departments, equipment put out of fire? Yeah, so a, a lot of times uh, the developers will actually fund the fire department. I've seen some counties request uh, like new fire equipment and training. So I, I know one project in Indiana, they actually need to buy new fire trucks for uh, the community to use in case something like that were to happen. And I, I believe they usually have, usually it's negotiated by the county, but usually what's negotiated is uh, yearly training for what, what the fire department would have to do for be funded by the developer. Well, right now, I think we have three, maybe four in this county. Anybody there that was qualified? Um, I know you've got setbacks and you've got screenings and all that, but you've also got agricultural fields. Who pays if the guy's 300 acres? Again, with, with those agreements, it, it spells out who's responsible for what as far as uh, the economic development agreement and then also the contracts between each. In most cases, developers do provide funds to the fire department for training and equipment that might be needed in, uh, with these types of projects. Um, so that way they're not left, you know, not knowing how to handle them because some of it will require some different types of training. Um, but if again, it depends on what the agreement is and what crops are grown there. But just like insurance today, you have insurance if if you know if your crops are destroyed by a fire caused from whatever it might be. And those things still have to come come into play on these types of projects. Would that burn like a fuse? One bank, I'll call it one row, whatever the end catches. Off. I've not heard of a whole row or, or a whole farm going up in flames. I have heard of a, a panel catching fire in a certain situation. I don't know how current those are because a lot of information that's out there on the web is from old technology. So, and that would be a question you would want to ask the developer as you're working with them. Okay, you know. What protections are there against these things? I think I can answer some of his questions to that because I took a solar panel while I was hiding it here a few years ago when I did solar. And usually it's only the panels so that catch on fire. Nothing the fire department can do with the project because what they say is these all have wires in. One wire might text another panel if I'm still But what where in county is that and directors act is it's like the pipeline group every year are mandated through the state of Indiana to finish, put on clients of spring park. That's what we're at. They train the fire come around once a year, put on clients like Pipeline group do new farmers that come on, they'll know what to do. If there is a fire. What I heard, there's not a whole farm field on fire. You can panel to call eight hundred. 
sit and watch it till they show up and fire off the fans. So very much. I appreciate it. Good, Charlotte. All of you um, asking questions and being in attendance. And um, I think Connie really emphasized something important: this communication. That's what we're trying to do this evening: is present um, information, resources, experiences from a variety of people in the world. And some of these concerns are really things that need to be thought through, so that you have a, an ordinance that is well put together. Um, you have agreements that are well put together and um, come up with something that's beneficial to everyone. Um, thank you again, and I hope you have a good evening and safe travels. Um, before we have this winter storm coming through here in the next couple of days. Thank you for coming in. Anything for you, sir. Did you touch anything on the heater? No. Okay. It's not recording. It? It should. That's why I wanted to make sure. Yeah.